Good morning, everyone. I'm Christine Paulus, Managing Director of The Well News. Thank you all for joining us this morning. At The Well News, we focus on covering common sense policymaking from the mayor's office to the West Wing and everywhere in between. By providing insightful reporting and opinions, we strive to foster more productive and insightful conversations. In short, we cut through the noise to provide coverage of the people and the issues that influence our everyday lives. Today, we're bringing you this event thanks to our sponsor, Center Forward. So I'd like to introduce Libby Greer, Center Forward board member, to give a few brief remarks before we begin. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate all of you being here this morning. Thanks to our wonderful panelists for breaking up your very busy week to join us. We really appreciate it. And to Kristen and Corey and Riley and the whole Center Forward team and everybody at the Well News, uh, we have a lot of experience doing events like this, and it's always sort of the highlight of any given week. Um, there comes a point, I've been in Washington 20 years, and there comes a point in every summer when the, the wisdom of sort of the August recess becomes very clear. <laughs> um, people are hot, they're tired, they're cranky, they smell bad, things are boiling, temperatures are rising, things are erupting, and this has been one of those weeks when the August recess is a very, very wise thing. Um, it's also one of the reasons that Center Forward was created. It is very easy for all of us to get mired in the extremes dominating the debate, whether it's in the press, under the dome of the Capitol, on Main Street. But we know that there are just as many people of differing opinions but very good will who want to come together and work together and do things in a common sense, sane, not bomb throwy, not name calling sort of way. And Center Four was created to make sure that there was always a platform or an avenue or a venue for those conversations to happen that were um, productive and that didn't just sort of cede the space to the left and the right. So we really appreciate all of you being here and being part of this conversation. Um, thank you for your support of Center Forward. Thank you for your support of the well. Let's try to keep it cool for the rest of the day. And I'll turn it over to Kristen to start the panel. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Libby. And I'll just reiterate what, what Libby said. For almost 10 years now, Center Forward has been um, in, a, in a polarized Washington, bringing Democrats and Republicans together for an honest uh, and productive com uh, conversation around the issues that matter to Americans. So um, thanks to Center Forward for all their hard work. Uh, I think that the members we have here today, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules, uh, represent really the best that Congress has to offer. They are the people that are coming together. <clears throat> Um, while they may not have the spotlight on them all the time by the media, um, they're the ones that are actually getting things done. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists today. Um, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy proudly represents Florida's uh, 7th Congressional District. Um, she was first elected in 2016. I think we all know um, she was the one who, was, uh, who beat John Micah um, that year. She currently serves on the House Ways and Means Committee, where she is a member of the Subcommittee on Trade and the Subcommittee on Worker and Family Support. And uh, Stephanie is also the co-chair of the House Blue Dog Coalition. Um, Congressman Derek Kilmer uh, represents Washington's sixth congressional district, uh, elected first in 2012, um, serves on the House Appropriations Committee, and also sits on the House Select Committee on Modernization, and is the chair of the New Democrat Coalition. So we know that Stephanie and Derek work together very closely. Um, next, we have uh, Congressman John Katko, who was first elected uh, to the 24th Congressional District uh, in 2014. He serves on the Homeland Security Committee as Chair of Transportation and Protective Security Subcommittee, um, and also serves on the House Committee on or Transportation and Infrastructure, and is the head of the Tuesday Group, um, a group that's been uh, very productive over the years, I think, in working with Democrats. Uh, Congressman Rodney Davis, currently serving the fourth term in Congress uh, for the 13th District of Illinois. Uh, he serves on the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee as well and ranking uh, member uh, on the Committee on House Administration and Committee on Agriculture, also a member of the Tuesday Group. So thank you all for joining us here today and I think that we will um, hand it over for a few, uh, few um, minutes of just introductory comments by each of you. Great, thank you. Thanks so much to Center Ford for having us here. Um, I'm really excited to be here because uh, I feel like I'm with friends and with people who have a shared perspective on how to um, govern in Washington. Um, as uh, 
Kristen said, I was elected in 2016, having never run for public office before or held public office before. But I had worked in the private sector, had worked at the Pentagon, had taught at um, a local liberal arts college. And in all of my work experience, I never once um, sat down at a conference table and said, hey, are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? It was always about the mission. It was always about um, what we were trying to achieve in that moment and then figuring out a way to hash out the differences and find the best path forward. And so um, in many ways, I bring that perspective to my job here in Washington. My district um, almost demands that of me. I'm one of seven districts in the country with zero partisan tilt, which means that I have a third Democrats, a third Republicans, and a third um, independents. So on any given day, I'm pissing off two thirds of my district. <laughs> But you know that's part of being a moderate is that when you're um, when you are trying to find that middle ground, you're likely to be hit from the left and the right. And I'm comfortable with that because as long as we are moving this country forward, um, that's my goal. And really glad to be serving in Congress um, with the folks up on stage with me and um, others that are part of the affiliated groups that were mentioned: Tuesday Group, New Dems, Blue Dogs, um, all folks who are looking uh, at ways to advance policy and try to serve this country. So uh, I'll echo the gratitude to uh, Center Forward and, and to The Well for putting this together. Um, uh, just a brief m word about myself and then about the new Dem. So um, March 3rd of 2012, I got a call from my predecessor who'd served here for 36 years. And he said, hey, in about an hour, I'm going to announce my retirement. And you should think about what you're going to do. And after I regained consciousness, I <laughs> called my wife and we went out for what was the um, longest and most serious dinner of our marriage. And we wrote the pro and the con list about running for Congress. And I'll tell you the top of the pro list and the top of the con list. Top of the pro list was, I feel like we got to get people working. And I represent a district in Washington state that is not Seattle, that has not seen the economic vitality that Seattle and Silicon Valley have seen. Top of the con list was, and I felt like I had something to contribute based on my background in that regard. Top of the con list was two things. One, I had two, uh, my kids were three and six at the time. And uh, secondly, I found much of what I saw out of Washington, D.C. entirely repellent. Um, I don't think I'm breaking news by suggesting things aren't working the way they ought to. And as we sat there in this little Indian restaurant in uh, Gig Harbor, Washington, I kept coming back to the top of the con list thinking maybe that's the reason to do it. It's because I've got kids and because it's broken. And frankly, we need to fix it. And that has absolutely influenced uh, my um, approach in this job. And it's uh, why I have so much enthusiasm about the New Dems. The New Dems are a coalition 103 members strong now. It's the largest ideological coalition in the Democratic caucus. And the common denominator is it's people who came here to get stuff done, who want to actually move our country forward on behalf of the American people. We call ourselves the New Dems, not because we're all new members, although we have a lot of new members. Uh, of the 40 uh, Democrats who flip seats from red to blue, 32 of them uh, ended up joining the New Democrat Coalition. Uh, but we call ourselves New Dems because we're really about looking at old problems through a new lens. Rather than you know, seeing the uh, discussion around economic policy as simply a re redistributive conversation around how to split the pie, we talk about how do you grow the pie and make sure that people have economic opportunity regardless of what zip code they live in. Rather than seeing government as either always the problem or the solution to all problems, we say, how do you reinvent government to make it work better on behalf of the American people? And I'm excited about that. And I think it lends itself to working across the aisle. Because um, frankly, the vast majority of America does not care about whether we get move more to the left or more to the right. They just want us to stop moving backward and start moving forward. Good, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm John Katko. I'm from Syracuse, New York. And I never say I'm from the New York's 24th because they think it's New York City. And I hate New York City. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a small town in Syracuse, New York. And uh, um, I spent most of my adult life as a federal organized crime prosecutor. And uh, I traveled literally the world doing it, uh, going after cartel drug traffickers, death penalty cases, organized crime, political corruption, you name it. And every time I, I did a case of any significance, I would form a task force of federal, state, local law enforcement. And they all had differing priorities and differing goals. And uh, that has really helped me since I went to Congress. And I, I never thought I'd go to Congress. Uh, I never thought I'd be in politics. But like my, my, two, my two colleagues who just spoke, um, 
you know, you can either sit on the sidelines and, and continue to gripe about it or do something about it. And what drove me into politics was the same thing that drove them into politics, is that we want to make a difference and show that bipartisanship can work. Mm -hmm. So I, I made a commitment to do that when I got here. Um, I routinely um, uh, try to espouse bipartisan tendencies. Uh, I never, never introduce a bill without a Democratic co-sponsor. I refuse to, and my staff knows that, so they don't even try to. And that has really helped. I've had more bills passed my first term, I was told, than any congressman in the history of our country. And it's not because I'm some great, great uh, litigator, or I was a litigator, a legislator. <laughs> but um, it's just that bipartisanship can work. And uh, I, I, I was really informed by looking at the relationship between Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, diametrically opposed on the, on the political ideologies. But they managed to do things that if we could get them done, we would be heroes. Social security reform, immigration reform, tax reform, and tax cuts. They, they, they did that together. A, a, a conservative Republican with a liberal uh, Speaker of the House. And we need to get back to that. And um, it's very hard every day. And Stephanie's absolutely right. If the far right is pissed off at me and the far right's pissed off at me, I know I'm doing well. And according to the current political climate, I'm really doing well. Because <laughs> they're, they're both really mad at me. But uh, you know, I constantly have to uh, walk a tightrope like my colleagues here. But it's worth it. Um, you know, people are so sick and tired of turning on the TV and seeing the nonsense. They just tuned out. And um, it's funny when you look at polling lately. People, um, economy is good, unemployment's low, wages are getting higher. People are concerned about health care for sure. But they have this general thing that really doesn't defies logic based on a lot of the measurables, and that is, they don't feel good about the country. They don't feel good about themselves because they don't feel good about the country. And that is really sad, and it's got to change. And if we don't do it, um, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. Because the far right and the far left do not bend. Uh, I mean, our Freedom Caucus is as bad as the, the far left in, in the Democratic Party. And it's 100% or nothing. Uh, it's a, I call it a zero-sum game with them. I sat down with some conservatives, just to give you an example, and I went chapter verse all the votes I did that they would like. And they said, yeah, we're going to vote for this one, so we can't endorse you. And it doesn't make sense. And we've got to get back to the tug and pull of uh, compromising. Um, I always say back home, I, I want to get to the point where compromise is cool again. And, and we don't have that. And shame on our leaders, too. When we had a majority last term, Paul Ryan didn't try to negotiate much with the other side. And, and the Democrat certainly, uh, Democratic leadership certainly isn't doing it with us now. Everything's about messaging bills, and it's, it doesn't get us anywhere. We have a lot of big things we need to deal with, infrastructure and uh, health care and a lot of other big, big things that we're just sweeping under the rug with that. And uh, we've got to do it in a bipartisan manner. And uh, until we do that, um, we're going to struggle. But uh, we take bullets every day and get the crap kicked out of us every day. And it, for some strange reason, I find it's worth it. And I take pride, and I know my colleagues do too, and I have an immense amount of respect for them. Because being in majority is even tougher, as you know, because so, you it's, it, it's, it's easier being a minority, uh, in a way. You just, it's easy just to say no. But I, I even voted for the Democratic Rules Package. I mean, so I got, I got caught a lot of heat for that. But the bottom line is it's the right thing to do, and everybody on this stage has the guts to do it, and that's why I'm, I'm really happy to be here with them, and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Oh, John, Derek, Stephanie, thank you. Um, Rodney Davis, Illinois' 13th District, and <coughs> let me tell you, it's a privilege to sit on stage with the folks that I look to to actually get things done in Washington. I'm honored to serve on the Modernization Committee that Derek is leading, and, and we're sitting around in a bipartisan manner. We're actually putting solutions on the table that we think will make the House work better. And that's important to me because I spent, before I got elected to Congress, I spent 16 years as a staffer for Congressman John Shimkus. You know, it's kind of odd you get to serve with the guy you worked for for 16 years, and sometimes he still thinks he's my boss and yells at me. Uh, but it's good to know that when you come into an institution like this, I had some preconceived notions about how to get things done, how things worked when I was a staffer, and I assumed when I got here they still work the same way, but it's changed. It's gotten more partisan. It's gotten more difficult to do things like pass bipartisan infrastructure bills. It's gotten more difficult to pass bipartisan farm bills. And remember, in 2012, I won the closest Republican victory in the nation. So I came here with a target on my back and being told I wasn't ever going to come back. So I started legislating in what, not a manner that's the middle, it's a manner I thought was right. 
I voted for, what was it, Superstorm Sandy Relief was one of my first votes. And I'm like, well, you know, if there's one thing that government should do well, is to help communities in this nation recover from natural disasters. Mm -hmm. And then I couldn't believe we got criticized for it because we voted for all the packages. That to me gave me an, an instant initiation into what Congress is all about. And I realized what John was saying is correct. The far right and the far left, it doesn't matter what you do. You're never going to appease them. And I find that a badge of honor too. Mm -hmm. This is, it's, it's those polar ends of the political spectrum that have stopped us from doing anything on immigration reform. You can blame one side or the other, but in the end, we can all go back to a time when one side or the other controlled all the institutions in Washington and they did absolutely nothing. What's ironic though, it's districts like mine, it's districts like Stephanie's and John's, you know, it's made up, these districts are the ones made up with the people in this Congress who most want to work with us regardless of party and get something done. And we're also the districts most likely to be flipped in any given year and especially any given wave. When we have wave years, our Tuesday group and our more moderate members get eviscerated. When we have wave years on our side, the blue dogs and the new Dems get eviscerated. The saddest part is you lose some of the best legislators. The key is how do we keep this coalition together in the middle, regardless of what our leadership teams say, and continue to be able to govern. And one last thing I want to mention that John said, we've got to change the dynamics of, of what this country is about. There's a concerted effort, I believe, on the far right and the far left to demonize the United States of America and our former government. This country is the greatest country in the history of the world. We've got to stand together and remind everyone of that. I mean, who else? I, I can't believe I'm the son of a high school dropout mother and the son of a father who walked into a fast food restaurant at age 16 and then never left. And because of that, my family achieved the American dream and allowed me to achieve the American dream. This is the greatest country in the history of the earth, and let's not forget we got to remind everyone of that every day. Thank you for having me, and thank you to Center Forward, too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, one thing comes to mind, you know, at the well was established because there was so much coverage of what was divisive, you know, and, and editors telling their writers that they can't write anything that, that wasn't born out of controversy, and what we wanted to do was cover things uh, uh, and the people who were coming together to get things done, and lo and behold, those are some of the highest readerships we have. So one of the first stories we did um, at the beginning of this year, uh, when all the coverage seems to be on, you know, who's being the loudest on the far right or the far left, was on the rules package. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess maybe, Stephanie, I'll put this to you. Since, since you were a leader in that effort, you know, what had to happen in order for that to come together? Because it was, I know it was significant, and it started well before the beginning of the Congress. And do you think that might be a model for how you know, members can move forward and actually actually get something significant done because that was significant. Yeah, so um, we called it the Speakers Project and it was launched well before the November 2018 election. And there were a number of Republicans and Democrats who took a pledge and basically committed themselves to not voting for a speaker who um, didn't uh, agree to a set of changes to the rules House Rules Package um, that would allow for um, bipartisan bills and amendments to have a path um, to be considered uh, that would um, kind of neutralize the extremes by changing the rule around how to vacate the chair. Um, it used to be that one person could call to vacate the, I'm sorry, vacate the speakers, um, speakership. Um, also, there were things in there that um, forced some transparency so that we would have time to review legislation before it got passed. Um, and those, those were all a part of this um, package. And we made the commitment, Republicans and Democrats, before knowing who would have the gavel. So this was a commitment that, um, that meant that it didn't matter who won in November. Um, we wanted to see these changes happen because it was good, good for the whole. And so in November, it turns out the House um, was going to be in Democratic hands. And um, as you remember, uh, from November, basically from Election Day and maybe even before, there was a huge effort to secure the speakership. 
Um, I was getting calls before I even knew whether I was going to be back in Congress urging me to vote a certain way on the speaker. And I'd already made this commitment. And um, as uh, the, the current speaker was collect collecting the support she needed to become speaker, um, she got to our group. And on the Democratic side, there were, I think, eight of us, seven or eight of us, um, that had made this commitment. And so um, I was one of three people who she rolled in. And, and I'm like, I feel I have PTSD. I'm like scratching here because <laughs> it was such a difficult conversation to have. But she put us in front of um, the chairs who are about to get, uh, get the gavel. And um, many of them saw it as a way for us to hand the keys to the Republican. That's, that's how they saw it. They saw it as us reducing chairmanships, um, the power of the chairmanship, the power of the majority. And ha trying to convince them otherwise was the big challenge that we had. Um, and and it was, it was um, some really sporty um, meetings um, that, you know, we made some um, changes and negotiated on the rules package, but we eventually got to a place where they agreed to accept um, uh, many of the changes, and now we have what's called the consensus calendar, which allows for bipartisan partisan amendments and bills to come forward. We have um, the changes to the speakership that I mentioned, and as well as um, the 72-hour um, rule and the 72-hour rule of being able to um, uh, review a package, a budget package doesn't count weekends. And so all of the sudden, in the last week, these rules have come into play and are, are helpful to leadership who initially were very resistant to them. We were able to put up um, our first vote on a consensus calendar um, bill. It passed with only three dissenting votes last night. Um, I think you go back about a week and a half when there was the, the left of our party battling with our speaker. She didn't, she wasn't, um, she wasn't held hostage to one person calling to vacate the chair if that had been something they wanted to do. Um, we're about, we're trying to lift the debt ceiling and um, John can talk about a letter that we put forward on that, lift the debt ceiling and get a budget deal. Um, you know, we have a 72 hour clock on that that doesn't count the weekends. And so, you know, it, it's creating the space for us to be able to get some really important things done. And I think at the time, it looked like um, reducing the majority's power, but what I think we're seeing happen, happening as these rules play out is that it's actually creating a better legislating environment and we're able to get some things done. And um, you know, it, it was worth it, I think. And John was one of three Republicans that voted for the House package, Tom Reed, and who was the third? Uh, Fitzpatrick, I Fitz. think, yeah. yeah. Um, so they were at, pissed at me too. Yeah. <laughs> and in two, it's been twenty some odd years since a uh, House Rules package has been bipartisan, has had you know um, votes from both sides of the aisle. And so, I'm I'm hopeful that that's the beginning of you know the ability to continue to use our unity and our leverage um, to get the changes um, made so that we do uh, do mm -hmm. uh, provide a path for bipartisanship. And Congressman Keck, I mean, that's a great segue if you want to talk about, a little bit about this letter because we all know we always come up to the, you know, to the wire on these budget negotiations and it's just a dangerous way to legislate. Um, so, you know, if, if members like you all can come together, I mean, how do you see this playing out and what was your objective behind sure. the letter? Sure. Uh, before that, I do got to note that uh, there's only one, re one reason I'm glad the Democrats won the House. I didn't have to go through it. Stephanie had to go through it in the majority. Yeah. That was brutal. What they did and the courage and the guts they showed standing up to leadership really was amazing and, and you should and you, I'm not just blowing smoke because you're here because I, I had a lot of respect for you and that's why I voted for it too and took heat for it because I wanted to show a little bit of like thank you for what you what you all went through and they went through an awful lot and it was one of those moments where you it made a difference and um, that's really important so you, you constantly try and find ways I'm constantly trying find, trying to find ways to work and show that bipartisanship works I, I even did it in the Homeland Security hearing yesterday Rebbe was beating up the Democrat for an amendment. I, I went to her defense, and then everybody folded and supported the amendment. That's what you're supposed to do, and that's what we should do. Not, not, you don't want to abandon your party's principles, 
um, but you you try to help out. And but this one, it's just common sense. And Stephanie and I got together, and she wants to use her clout from uh, from the the the, uh, the, the uh, new dogs, uh, blue, blue, blue dogs, dogs, blue dogs, new <laughs> dogs, new blue dogs. How's that? Yeah, the we are. Yeah, blue dogs. Uh, blue dogs and uh, mine with Tuesday group to try and get uh, just a consensus, a letter sent to the leadership that says, look, we've got the debt ceiling, we've, we've got uh, a budget issue, budget caps and some other things. Let's not, you know, let's work in a bipartisan manner to get a deal done and let's not wait till last minute to get it done. Let's work on it now, basically is what it says. And it has, it, it's good because Democrats and Republicans signed a letter, and a lot of them. And uh, we, we submitted it yesterday and uh, hopefully to have an impact that you know, it's, it, at a minimum, it's a reminder to leadership that, hey, we're here, and uh, I know you have to worry about the left and the right, uh, but um, uh, we, we, want, we want something done. And I, I can't underscore enough how important that one rules provision was about the motion to vacate the chair. Um, that is what held uh, leadership hostage, especially Boehner, and that's really kind of what drove him out after a while if he got fed up with a constant threat. The Freedom Caucus would constantly basically threaten to file a motion to vacate the chair, which means they're gonna have a vote to get rid of the speaker. And in order to, in order to um, avoid that, a lot of times the speaker would appease the far right to the detriment of good legislation. So that provision alone makes a profound difference when the speaker has enough wiggle room to know that, okay, if things aren't going our way, um, uh, the, I, I, it's not going far away by an extreme element of the party, they're not gonna file this motion to vacate the chair. They did it, and when I was, since I've been in Congress, Mark Meadows did it to Boehner, and it never didn't go anywhere, but he did it, and so the threat is real. And I think that's why um, uh, she, uh, Pelosi was kind of, not bailed out, but she, she, was, she felt like she could turn, you know, stand up to the far left a little bit when it came to the, uh, um, the, the border supplemental funding. Uh, that was a stalemate, and the far left wanted all these things in there, like getting rid of ICE and defunding, as part, not paying ICE and all this stuff. And we needed to get the money to the border. People are suffering at the border. And so a bunch of Democrats, a bunch of Republicans got together from the Problem Solvers Caucus, of which I was one, and we stood, I stood on the floor of the House and said, you know, bipartisanship is broken out. Uh, we have 23 Democrats and 23 Republicans that would want to vote for the Senate version of that funding bill. And at that point, or soon thereafter, they gave up and they put it up for a vote and it got 300 votes. So giving Pelosi, the speaker, the wig room to kind of allow that to happen was really good. And um, that's why this rules package sounds wonky, but it's really important, so. I agree. Um, you know, I think one of the, it was interesting to me because a lot of us remember um, 2010 when you know, the Democrats just suffered devastating losses. The you know, Republicans had a much bigger majority than, we, than the Democrats have now. And you know, what, a, what a lot of us in the middle experienced um, as a staffer at the time was our party all of a sudden was, had no incentive and was unwilling to work with the other side. Um, and like it, it's because we lost a lot of the, the members who were willing to work. In the Republican conference, do you see a willingness by members to, to work with the other side or just it's, is it just a, such a polarized environment that do you think anything can get done? And, and if so, what do you think can get done? I think it can, and, and it's led by the folks that have a tr proven track record of doing so. Uh, there are ways that we can all come together, and, and ironically, what doesn't get enough attention is the majority of what we do in Washington, the majority of what we vote on on the floor is overwhelmingly bipartisan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the true. focus in the 24-hour news cycle is always where we disagree. You know, I gotta give the folks on, on this stage credit, and a lot of the folks that were mentioned earlier credit, because all of us have shown a willingness to stand up and buck our own leadership team to do what we think is, is good for the country and it was good for the institution. You know, being a former staffer, I want to be able to make this institution work better. Uh, the rules package, that, the changes are going to change the House forever. And it's ironic, I'm glad you guys got as much pushback as I did when we introduced something similar uh, a few years ago. Ta uh, Morgan Griffith and Luke Messer and I tried to introduce some rules changes when we were in the majority, just with our majority. Oh, you would have thought we were trying to give the Democrats the keys to the castle. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's ironic, some of the then committee chairmen who uh, came up and personally uh, let me, you know, let their feelings be very clearly known to me, uh, are some of the ones that were most adamant in wanting to change the rules package now that they weren't chairman anymore. Um, but that's, you know, that's part of Congress too. The institution is what it is. 
we've got to figure out a way to get enough votes and enough of us together to work within the institution to change it. That's what the rules package has done. That's what the modernization committee is doing. Mm -hmm. I know there's a willingness to, to be there. I know there's a willingness of folks on both sides of the aisle to work together, but we've got to make sure that the House works in a way to allow us to do that. And before that rules change, those rules changes, they didn't. The consensus cal calendar with the Cadillac tax was a great, great vote last night. I'm hoping a bill that I've had since I got here, it's the Social Security and GPO WEP reform. You know, we're almost to the point where we might be able to get on the consensus calendar with it. I mean, these are <clears> bills <throat> that have been languishing not just for years, but for decades. That's a big deal. Don't underestimate mm -hmm. what is happening right now and how that can empower mm -hmm. people to move to the middle. And you have extraordinary bipartisan support for that bill. Ex yes. Yes. Yeah. And just quickly add to that, I think that there is an appetite um, with, the, with Republicans for bipartisanship. It's not as strong as it should be. A lot of people are afraid to step out, but you're seeing more wanting to do it. And um, uh, I think it'll be very important if we take over the House to make sure that those, those, that rules package stays the same. So the speaker, every speaker wants, wants, wants uh, to be bailed out once in a while. And they would, they, I, like I think you said, I think um, your, your leadership now is realizing how good those rules packages are for them. It gives them wiggle room. And so I think we're, our, it'll be our job if and when we ever take over the House again to make sure that those rules continue. Mm -hmm. So, um, there are a lot, and I'll put this question to Congressman Kilmer first. You know, if you if you watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox or any of the cable news shows, you know, you would see, you would think that the the only the only things that are happening are on the far right and the far left, yeah. and that because um, that's where the coverage is. I mean, that's that's where the the fiery rhetoric and the hyperpartisanship exists. But like you said, there's so much that's getting done. How do you break through that noise? I know the New Dems do a lot of work um, with your incredible staff on pushing out messages, talking about bipartisanship, putting principles out there. So how do you think you, you break through the noise? So uh, uh, it, it's a great question. I persistently <laughs> joke that um, if the New Dems held a rally on the steps of the Capitol, I would yell, what do we want? And everyone would yell, a comprehensive approach to job creation that includes infrastructure <laughs> investment, workforce development, and a smarter approach to taxes and trade. And then I'd go, when do we want it? And everyone would yell, we're willing to work in a collaborative way to bring people together. You know, um, no one comes to my rallies. Uh, but um, I guess to, to, to that point, uh, those, uh, those efforts, those priorities are where the vast majority of the American people are. Mm -hmm. you know, they want to make sure that no matter where you live, you can earn a good living, that you can have health care, that we have uh, sort of sane uh, uh, policies. Um, and uh, so, so again, part of our approach is to drive um, still big, bold solutions, but that have a chance of making it across the finish line. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge in, in the current media environment. We had a, a week uh, where the New Dems rolled out uh, priorities for stabilizing the Affordable Care Act, which I actually think a lot of what we put on the table could pass the House, pass the Senate, and even be signed by the President. They're, they are common sense things that if you care about providing more access to more affordable health care uh, and setting aside the sort of uh, partisanship around health care issues, we could move forward. We did that in the same week that there was a hearing on a single payer proposal. So quick question. Um, uh, uh, how many think that the New Dems stabilization of the Affordable Care Act package got the most media attention? <laughs> Raise your hands. Right. Second question. How many of you think that the approach around stabilization of the Affordable Care Act has a higher likelihood of becoming law? So that, I mean, to, to, to me, at the end of the day, the, the proof is in the, in the pudding in terms mm -hmm. of where can you actually drive impact for your constituents and make a difference on behalf of the American people. And that's really, I think, you know, that drives a lot of our work. We, uh, as a coalition, um, have just sent a letter to, or, or are sending a letter to the president around 
trying to get Humpty Dumpty back on the wall for infrastructure. I think there is a real opportunity. You know, there's still not Republican bridges or Democratic roads. The American Society of Civil Engineers says that American infrastructure grades out at a D plus. There is an enormous opportunity there because it's one of the areas where the Venn diagram has some overlap between what Republicans want and Democrats want. So we should at least move forward there. There is, um, uh, we, we are, we've, I think just yesterday or, or today are sending a letter to House leadership saying, let's take up the prescription drug pricing bills that passed out of committee on a bipartisan basis. They got attached to some things that lost Republican support and as a consequence are going, you know, they're nowheresville in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Let's at least take those up as standalone bills have them pass in a broad, with broad bipartisan support in hopes that they can get done and actually start providing relief to the American people. Speaking of health care, I mean, it, it's emerging as a top issue, um, driven a lot by the presidential candidates, but also certain members of the, the Democratic caucus. And it's interesting, I was reading an, uh, an op-ed uh, by former OMB director Peter Orzag, the OMB director in the Obama administration, and he said, you know, Medicare for all is the is the Democrats repeal and replace. Meaning, you make all these promises and can you deliver? Um, and you touched on this a little bit, but I'm wondering, you know, where do you think, and do you think if there's possibility at all, headed into 2020 that there is um, an appetite to get something done incrementally on healthcare? I mean, it's just such a hot button issue and a lot of time leadership doesn't want to give the other side bipartisan wins heading into election year, but you know, what do you think the appetite is on your side to maybe work with them on some of the issues? Go ahead, Stephanie. I know that you, the Blue Dogs also just released your yeah. um, health care principles. You know, I, 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 when I'm in my district, I meet with people um, who have heartbreaking stories about rationing uh, prescription uh, drugs for their children because they can't afford to um, uh, buy and and take the prescription as intended because it's too <coughs> expensive. I talk to people who show up and are clearly um, still recovering from surgery who uh, that came about because of a pre-existing condition that they had and you know they've had to um, have surgery and are recovering but will need care for the rest of their lives. I meet people who um, are sick and can't afford the care that they, they need. They know what the, the path to wellness is, but they can't afford that procedure. And as somebody who's experienced health issues, had, had family experience health issues, those are the hardest meetings and the hardest conversations I have because they are so desperate for changes to our current health system, health, uh, healthcare system today that can actually address these specific issues. And the idea that we would hold up good policy that could make a difference in any one of these people's lives because there's an election coming or an election year or because of political reasons feels like professional malpractice as an elected official. And so I, you know, I think that we have to keep pushing forward with the things that can make it through um, a divided Congress. And there's a lot of it, just as Derek said. There, and uh, the Blue Dogs have also put out their, the healthcare principles and <coughs> things that we, we think we can move forward on and um, wanna be able to do that. You know, the consensus calendar is one approach to get it to the floor, but leadership should loosen should make do the right thing as well. I mean, it shouldn't always have to go through this build your grand um, bipartisan 290 co-sponsor um, support before um, it gets to the floor. Um, you know, and we've, we've done our messaging bill. I think we've spent a, a quite a bit of time, you know, doing messaging bills. Um, and now it's time to break out the pieces that we think can move and send those through, send them to the Senate and, um, if Senator McConnell wants to look all of these people across the country in the eye and say to them that I refuse to move um, bipartisan bills that could have been signed by the president, let him be the one that does that. But I think in the House, we have to um, shake some of this stuff loose and, and get it over there and see if we can't move forward because there are too many people wh whose lives depend on this. Right, right. 
Um, so I know that we just have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, the members have got to get back to the Hill, but I think Riley, do you want to go? Oh, okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, you may or may not be aware, but um, there was a bill that was going to be co-sponsored by Congressman Holding for tax fairness for Americans abroad. Um, it has the support of both the Democrats abroad and the Republicans abroad. Um, and the voices of 9 million plus Americans abroad trying to achieve fair taxes and an end to citizenship-based taxation have, I guess, been going unheard because of this um, hyperpartisanship. Uh, do you think this is an issue you guys could look into? Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. simple right answer is yes, of course. Yes. Congressman Nye. Thanks. So, first of all, I <clears throat> want to say thanks to Kristen and Corey and the Well News for telling the stories that are underreported but need to be told, the kind of stories we're talking about today. We really appreciate that. And as a former New Dam and Blue Dog, I can appreciate the comments that our panelists have made today about taking bullets from the left and the right. Thank you for continuing to do the hard work and uh, suffering the slings and arrows and continuing to work hard to make our country a better place. The question I have, and I guess this is for anybody who wants to take it, is um, how can we shift political power to the broad center of, American, of the American public that really just wants to see Congress get things done you talked about how the power lies largely on those fringes nowadays, and their incentive is not to get things done, but to just toe the party line. So what are the ways that you think we can try to shift the power back to that, that center that really just wants to see us get things accomplished? I, I think it's a Herculean task, um, but it's something we have to do, and we, we do it every day, right? Um, I think also it's working on the media. Um, first of all, doing everything we've talked about with bills and introducing bills that are going to pass, get bipartisan consensus, sending letters like Stephanie and I did, just keep showing every day that bipartisanship works. But I also, as we were sitting here just thinking, um, the media loves the, the, the vitriol because it sells. MSNBC's ratings were terrible until Trump came along and they found a foil to hate. And you know, he deserves a lot of what he gets, right? But, but in the process, they don't cover many of the good things at all. And I just thought of one quick thing when, when the others were talking. 21st Century Cures is probably one of the biggest, has going to have one of the biggest impacts on medical costs in the next several decades. And I bet you most of you have never heard of it. It was passed several years ago, and it increased funding to NIH exponentially, billions upon billions of dollars. In the short period of time that they've had that funding, they've been able to um, isolate uh, gene mutations that make, lead to all kinds of cures for diseases from sickle cell to Alzheimer's. And if they find a cure for Alzheimer's, for example, in the next couple of years, um, they think that, that would be, first of all, that Alzheimer's is the biggest, going to be the biggest medical cause in the next generation. And I just lost my father to Alzheimer's, so it's too late for him. But I can tell you that if you find a cure for Alzheimer's alone, that totally changes a medical dynamic, medical cost dynamic. So highlighting the good things that are happening is, is, is so frustrating. They won't cover that. They won't cover the fact that Stephanie and I are working together. They won't cover the fact that Rodney and Derek are doing things, and we've got to try and put pressure on them to do that as well. Um, I had, I've had 35 bills pass the House and 10 signed into law by Obama and 10 by Trump. And I bet you my local newspaper maybe covered one-third of those bills' passages, at the most. And we've sent out a press release on every one. It's not controversial enough, and, and I, that's what's frustrating. I, I have an uh, experience with that, too. So I was at something similar to this, and I had the audacity to declare myself a proud Democrat, but also a proud capitalist. And- um, How dare you. I know, right? <laughs> uh, I, and it's not in vogue, I think, in some corners of my party um, these days, the word capitalism. But I, I did qualify it with the fact that we have a system that we have to make changes and fix. And um, uh, Fox News and the conservative media picked it up and ran it over and over, like, look at this democratic unicorn. She believes in capitalism. And I mean, and we all know that that's not true. There are a lot of Democrats who believe in capitalism <laughs> and, um, and feel the way that I, uh, you know, uh, how I express myself. And so I um, sought to write a op-ed kind of explaining what, what I meant by that, the changes I thought needed to still be made to our overall system. 
um, why I'm a proud capitalist, um, given my history, um, knowing what the alternative looks like, having escaped communist Vietnam. Um, and it was an op-ed that took me almost an entire month to get a, liberal, uh, a mainstream media organization to carry. And they said no before they said yes. Fox News, Fox and Friends wanted me on, like constantly calling us. The conservative media wanted to have what they were painting as an outlier mm -hmm. um, on to, to, to continue to stoke this narrative that was politically advantageous for um, conservatives to say that all of Democrats don't believe in capitalism. And, but meanwhile, nobody in, um, in MSNB, you know, none of those folks wanted to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And so not only do we have polarized um, media, we have media that aren't <clears throat> helping the party that they're theoretically aligned with. Um, you know, and so it took a month before the Post finally ran the op-ed. But it shouldn't have been that hard um, because I can point to other people who they can write whatever they want and it, it'll land in the op-ed op pages of um, those, those yeah. papers. And I, I think the media has to take a greater responsibility um, for uh, what comes of their uh, editorial decisions. Um, what they choose to cover and, and what they choose to allow to run on their op-ed pages. Obviously, the well, you guys are trying mm -hmm. to provide that platform for the center, but we need we need other uh, other media to be willing to provide both sides of it, um, fair and balanced. Balance implies that uh, you get we have the predominant perspective, but you get somebody who represents a smaller part of that perspective to also provide their opinion, and now it looks like it's an even match, as opposed to you know, reflecting what is true, which is that if it's an outlier position, you don't put them on with the people who represent the broad majority of the opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's just not the way that the media works these days. Yeah. Here's, uh, here's the good news. Wrap. The good news is I think we're on the right track. Mm -hmm. you know, we've changed some things institutionally within the House. They're going to lead us down the path, I believe, to be able to, to create an environment where you see bipartisanship and bipartisan solutions flourish. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, it's groups like Center Forward, it's outlets like the Well News, it's folks like this and all of you in this room that are going to help us spread that message. Absolutely. Because as Stephanie said, as John said, you know, the 24-hour news cycle is not going to cover what we're doing here today. I don't see any Fox News or MSNBC cameras around here, and they're never going to. And I think it's pretty telling when John said he couldn't even get his local newspaper to talk about all the bills that he passed. I guarantee it was zero in the national media that talked about any of those bills. Thanks, Rodney. Uh, <laughs> you know why? Because they're good bills. They actually made the country better. And that's why we've got to continue mm -hmm. to spread the message when we leave here today that we're not just up here for the panel. We're going to continue to work together. We're going to continue to make this place work. And we all have that same vision, the same goal, is to move into an environment where those of us who are here on the stage continue to see more success. But we got to change the media environment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's going to be very difficult to do, but we can't stop trying. Yeah, totally. Some well of it's on, on Congress, though, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, there are terrific examples of bipartisan progress that has, have been made. 20, 21st Century Curious is a, is a terrific mm -hmm. example of that. Uh, having said that, uh, there have been a number of high-profile bills with either party in charge that have, that have moved uh, in, a, in a partisan way. And then we end up yep. sort of relitigating, yep. uh, whether that be the Affordable Care Act or the tax reform bill, mm -hmm. you know, bills that were not developed in a bipartisan way, were not passed in a bipartisan way. And then um, you see this sort of years of, of relitigation. And I think for, for the everyday American, they look at that and say, you know, what a crap show, right? That, that, that doesn't seem like how things ought to be working. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot too much legislative time is spent on things that seem more designed to make a statement than to make a law. And that's, that's not on the media, right? That, that's on Congress in the aggregate. Um, part, part of my excitement about working with Rodney on the select committee on the moder about every 20 or 30 years, Congress realizes things aren't working the way they ought to, and they create a committee to look at fixing it. And this year's committee is called the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. 
Um, but we've been tasked with looking a lot at a lot of those structural issues, including the rules, some of the rules that may impede bipartisanship, um, uh, the, the, the loss of capacity within the legislative branch, where you've seen such extraordinary turnover of staff as an example, that as a consequence of that, what fills that void is the executive branch and lobbyists. And that doesn't serve the interests of the American people. And so a lot of what we're working on is trying to figure out how do you pull some of those levers to have Congress as an institution simply function better on behalf of the American people. If and when that happens, and if we're successful in moving, and stay tuned, because we're working on a bunch of good stuff, including next week we're hoping to move out about a couple dozen recommendations uh, on that front. I think the hope is Maybe if you just fix some of this stuff within the institution, Congress starts to, um, uh, it stops underperforming. And, and then maybe some of that political polarization. It's a lot easier to say, well, let's just blow it all up when the everyday American doesn't feel like it's working for them. And you know, we're at a time where Congress is, according to polling, held in lower regard than head lice and colonoscopies, right? And that, uh, and, and too often Congress earns those ratings. With that, thank you all so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Like I said, you guys are the best uh, that we have in the House, and we rely on you. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. Yes. Thanks, you guys.